Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to Human Stories in AI with StackQuest and Lightning AI. In this series, we'll hear about the career journeys of passionate AI experts. From their humble beginnings to conquer challenges, we'll be inspired by the real-world experiences of professionals thriving in the ever-evolving AI landscape. Human Stories in AI is brought to you by Lightning AI. Code together, prototype, train, and deploy AI web apps, all from your browser with zero setup. Personally, I love Lightning AI because it makes it super easy to use and learn from the StatQuest coding tutorials. Just go to the web page, click on the Run button, and bam! You get code that you can play with without downloading anything or installing any packages. Today, we have special guest Cushy Jane, who works in data analytics development at John Deere. She's also in the master's program at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, working on a master's in computer science, data science. Having recently graduated with her bachelor's, Cushy participated in the data science club and also completed several internships at John Deere. So, without further ado, Cushy, can you tell us about your journey to where you are right now at John Deere and the University of Illinois? How did this all start? Absolutely. So um, I guess a fun fact, um, my whole life, I, I was never that student who's like, I'm going to be code, you know, from middle school and I love tech. In fact, I was very like, oh, I'm terrible at tech. Oh. And I defined it based on things like, can I just like, you know, do computers? What people often don't realize there's a lot to computers, like there's the hardware side, there's the software side. Of course, I didn't know that as a student and I was very much into science. I was that, you know, classic science Olympiad geek, um, you know, and I just loved all kinds of sciences. And then my junior year of high school, my dad said, why don't you try an, a computer science class? I really think you'll enjoy it. And I, I didn't want to initially, but I was like, fine, dad, I'll try it. Um, and I ended up feeling a very, I don't know, crazy kind of a rush in that class. I just, uh, I mean, I'm not to say that I'm a very instant gratification person, but I just loved when code worked. Like it made me feel like intensely satisfied. And somehow that was enough of, of a feeling to just make me want to pursue computer science or something with coding. Um, and so, yeah, that was the initial start of it, but I ended up you know, really changing paths. So I didn't get into computer science at U of I, unfortunately. Um, okay. So I ended up taking information science, okay. um, not being sure about it initially, but I ended up loving it. And I, I truly believe that everything happens for a reason. Um, and information science is that really nice balance where you do get to focus on the technical side of things, but also the human centric side and how do you make things customer oriented and how do you present yourself? How do you present your data? How do you present your technology? Um, and that's how I kind of got into data science um, and not just learning, you know, how to just code, mm -hmm. but how to apply your knowledge and present in a way that appeals to different kinds of audiences. So yeah. it ended up working out really well, but I hope long story short, that answers to some degree how I got here. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I mean, I'll be honest, I have a similar sort of love of coding where uh, to me, it's like solving certain problems puzzles, like little, you know, it's like doing a Sudoku or doing a crossword puzzle, you know, when it works, it, you just feel fantastic about it. And to be honest, for me, even when it doesn't work, I almost always learn something from that. And, and I also just like love that process of learning. So even, even, even a failure is still kind of like mildly a success for me. Um, and I also love that you like uh, sort of the, the data science side of it. To me, that's always been super important. Personally, uh, when I first got my a job uh, after my PhD, I got a job in a biological genetics lab, and I knew very little about those things. They were all doing experiments. I was just the numbers guy, but I loved trying to communicate to them and trying to relate sort of the data analysis that I was doing with them. Uh, so I'm in, in some ways, I feel like we might be kindred spirits in that. <laughs> <laughs> we both oh, yeah, I'm a kindred spirit with Josh. That's so cool. <laughs> I don't know what people know, but I am a huge, huge fan of StatQuest. Like yeah. StatQuest got me through a lot of concepts like gradient descent. So wow. um, well, huge fan. So it's <laughs> amazing that you're saying something like this. It feels so special. <laughs> I well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, 
I guess you get the idea, right? The whole idea, the whole idea of, of what I love is, is I love the communication aspect. Uh, and I love that it's part of a bigger picture. And it's not just sort of like coding for coding's sake. You know, it's it's about community. It's about solving big problems. And that's what I loved about being part of science. And I and, and you being kind of a, 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 also a science nerd like me. Um, you know, it gets us, it gets us in, it gets us to be a part of that, but in a, in a, in a way that for me, I've discovered a lot of people are scared of, a lot of people are scared of the analytics. And so if we can do it for them, we're really doing a great favor or a service or just really being helpful. And I, and I just, and I like being helpful. (laughs) Absolutely. I completely agree with you on that. And I think, uh, that's also part of why um, we run the Illinois Data Science Club here at U of I, but we believe that every field can apply data yeah. science to opt- yes. optimize decision making. Yeah. So I completely agree. It can be a very interdisciplinary field. I love it. W- would you be willing to tell us about the Illinois Data Science Club? Yeah, sure. So um, our very first, although I did not found it, mm-hmm. um, we kind of started our first semester together with the phone with the founder, my my roommate Ria Shah, okay. who's also a student here at U of I with the same major. Mm-hmm. Um, and our thought was, you know, we wanted to find a community that was not doing some kind of like hardcore hackathon or hardcore, you know, tech consulting where you have a client and a deliverable and there's just a lot of pressure. Uh-huh. We wanted to make it a little more, I guess, for lack of better terms, a low key, okay. where people of different, you know levels of experience can come to a safe community Mm -hmm. and learn some data science. Um, And yeah, we're not expecting that people will be experts at the end of this. There's different levels of expertise, of course, but they might have learned how to use data in a useful way and in a subject of their interest. We didn't want to force a project or how they want to do something. We just want to create some sort of guidelines and guide them through a project of their choice. And they get to do a showcase and uh, present their idea. Um, and yeah, the key I, key thing behind our mo- uh, motto was that uh, we don't just do data for data. We do it to solve a bigger problem, whether it's business or societal. So that is kind of like the uh, key underlying theme of our club. But yeah, that's a little bit about us. <laughs> I love that. I love that motto too. You don't just do data for data. You do data to solve bigger, more important problems. I, 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 I feel like if there's one takeaway from this podcast episode, it's right there. That's a nugget of awesomeness. I love it. <laughs> um, well, can you tell us a little bit what, what you're doing now? I, I understand you're a, a senior about to graduate. Uh, yeah, sure. So now, well, yeah, of course, this is my last semester. I'm graduating. And if all things go well, I plan on pursuing my master's in data science here okay. at UIUC. It's called the MCSDS, Master's in Computer Science, Data Science. And I want to work full time while I do it because it's online um, and get all the experience that I can. That is the plan so far. I love that plan. Uh, (laughs) You also had a summer internship at John Deere. That's Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, What you did? How did you even get the internship to begin with? Um, Any details? I would love to hear all about it. Yeah, so uh, I'm very thankful to John Deere because they've given me numerous amazing opportunities, not just one internship. I interned there twice and I even did part time there. Um, Yeah, so how I got my first internship in soft or actually end of sophomore year. um, Well, I don't know if I even had a good resume or not, but they liked all the Python stuff I had in there. That's what they told me. I think all credit goes to one main class. And it's kind of funny, it's not my hardest class. It wasn't like data structures or something. It was a very basic data discovery class. And they taught you the basics of Python and how to apply in a statistical sort of way. Um, For those who are from U of I, shout out to the class STAT 207. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it's called data science discovery. And yeah, I basically learned like the absolute basics of, you know, how to do like sklearn packages and what to do with your data, um, how to do feature engineer to some degree, a bit of feature engineering, mm-hmm. um, and that whole pipeline. And that, I guess, was enough knowledge to get me my first internship. That's fantastic. Um, I love all that stuff too. That, to be honest, that was also my gateway into sort of data science in the Python realm. Was was I saw that in in Scikit Learn they had um, all these machine learning models. 
And what I thought was super cool about it is once you got your data, which took forever, but once you got it, you could then just try a ton, a ton of different models on it without like having to do a whole lot more work. Um, and so I love that. Well, that sounds fantastic. So you got these internships, which are, which are great. Can you tell us a little bit what you did during those internships? Oh yeah. I forgot to answer that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. um, yeah. So my first internship was a very classic analytics one. It felt, um, we did like customer call sentiment analysis and like, you know, grouping calls into red, yellow, or green based on, you know, how they're feeling. Um, my biggest takeaway from that internship was data. I, that's when I truly realized data is what matters the most. We tried a bunch of, you know, ML models and we came to the conclusion that, you know, this is probably not going to work out so well as of now because um, the audio transcriptions, mm -hmm. the quality of those are not so great. Mm -hmm. um, and humans, uh, you know, on their own are not, sh like people at the company are not sure how to, you know, classify calls because okay. it was not clear. Okay. So what better is a machine learning model going to do? And I learned that ML is not magic. Um, if a human can't do it at all or not so great, there's a high chance an ML model won't do it that well either. But it was a great learning process. And um, yeah, I, I learned what all it might take to make a good model, um, cool. all the stuff ahead that you do. Um, so also just, yeah, go ahead. Hey, sorry. Well, just, just, sorry to butt in a little bit. It sounds like what you had right there was a, was a problem basically just getting good training data, right? Absolutely. And I feel like that's, that's a big theme across a lot of these podcast episodes where 90% uh, of it is getting good training data. And when you can't get good training data, I mean, you do the best you can, but you really just, it's, it's just, that's all you can do. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you can't make miracles happen. Yeah, and also like labeling your calls. Uh, like uh -huh. for example, we realized a lot of our calls are not even actual, like calls from the customer end. They're sort of like workers at John Deere who are kind of working on the field. Okay. Um, but they're not the real customers, and of course they speak in a different tone, yeah. um, or way, and it might seem negative, or you know it could be anything. Yeah. And the reality is, actually, you should not even be looking at that call in the first place, and uh, that tone is all relative. Yeah. to the type of people that are talking to one another. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, I mean, uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from that, right? Is, For is, sure. is how do you, how do you, when you're getting data, when you're focusing on data, how do you get the data you need? And sometimes that's really hard because it's usually all just put in one big bin, in one big box, and they go, here's our data. And, and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I've got to sort through all this stuff. And sometimes yeah. that's easy to do. And sometimes that's like next to impossible. Absolutely. And all like the, the efforts to label the data that mm -hmm. can be, yeah, they might have tons and tons of calls, but mm -hmm. we need people to painstakingly sit through them, process them and label them as red, yellow or green. Um, and that's not always the easiest thing to do. We couldn't get a ton of training data. So that was also another problem. Um, but yeah, that was my first internship. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I won't go over everything I did at John Deere because it'll take too long. But my second internship um, was actually a um, very uh, natural language processing heavy one. Actually, the last one was also natural language processing because I had to process calls Mm -hmm. using natural language techniques. And I don't know if you've heard of TF, IDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency. I but don't, but I'll ask you about it. essentially trying to look at your calls to gauge um, how important is a particular word okay. with reference to a particular. So like, for example, the word the uh -huh. is likely to appear in everything. Yep. So you look at also not just how frequently does the word the appear in a specific call and what sentiments associate with, but how, how frequently does it occur in all the calls? And if there's like a particular word that has, that has, you know, is associated with a bad sentiment mm -hmm. and it's not like a normal word, we're like, oh, okay. So that word is associated with bad sentiment. That's kind of how, you know, um, things like naive Bayes algorithms works. Um, yeah. And, yeah. 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 Uh, sorry. I will move on to, yeah. My next. No, I, I love it. I, I know, you know, this is great. I, <laughs> one of the highlights of this whole podcast is, is a learning opportunity for me. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I love it. Yeah. So thank you very much for teaching me about a new term and a new technique. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. So my next internship was more natural language heavy and it. If this is the give context, this was after chat GPT came out, okay. the whole generative AI boom. Mm -hmm. And 
what they wanted to do, I was working in factory automation, and they wanted to find a way to improve the completeness and accuracy of um, machine defect documentation at a factory. Um, and to give context, you know, operators are working on the assembly line, and when they run into a defect, besides just figuring out what base machine and what model and whatnot, you have to figure out, look through like hundreds of thousands of parts and figure out which part do you have the issue with and what exactly is wrong. Um, and summarizing it well, and that can be a very tedious process. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to create a sort of like a sub automated um, solution to this. Um, and this is also another important point that you don't wanna always completely rely on AI. Mm -hmm. Sometimes merging it with human intelligence can give you the best output over trying to fine tune and get perfect accuracy in your model. Um, and what this approach essentially did was we used our bill of materials um, and we put it into a vector database type of a setup. And we started out broad. It's a, it was a hierarchical bomb. So you have the broad level machine parts okay. and the more specific machine parts within those broad levels. Okay. And you kind of go through each level until you get to a specific part. Okay. Um, and it's like a series of questions. Like you'll be presented with the top five parts to the, like to, on the user end and he or she would pick one and then you would get deeper. Um, is it almost like a decision tree to a certain degree, like, or like a class, you know, like, like where, you know, there's all these sort of, if this part, then this, or, or am I completely off on that? With the decision tree, it's more hardcore ML where, um, well, I guess in terms if the, the one characteristic that's similar is narrowing down your options. Uh -huh. Um, however, it's, this one is very like, um, embeddings based. So are called the um, the parts they could convert it to something called embeddings, which is like a numerical version okay. of the words, but also as context, uh -huh. right? It's not like if something contains apple and this also contains apple, then they're similar. Yeah. Apple is also associated with red. So it has yeah. knowledge about the English language and you do similarity searches with the user's initial description and oh. you find the closest thing. But the nice thing is you don't have to do it um, you don't have to really do it with all 200,000 parts as one. They're categorized. Mm -hmm. So you find the closest, bigger category. Yeah. So how many of these parts um, match it the most? And what do most of those parts fall into? Mm -hmm. And that's how you select the category. Oh, I love it. I, I, I love it because it's, it's sort of like this divide and conquer strategy for identifying what the real problem is. Uh, Absolutely. Rather than rather than trying to tackle everything all at once, you've, you've broken it down into smaller pieces. And I, it makes a lot of sense to me. I think it sounds fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, that, that, I guess it's really, I, this is my favorite project because mm -hmm. um, it's in a field that I really like. And it kind of mm -hmm. brought in the core of my major, mm -hmm. which is understanding how to integrate human intelligence with AI intelligence, how mm -hmm. to incorporate the human centric aspect. I love that, that my solution really, really, you know, was true to that, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's not just AI picking one out of 200,000 parts, the user itself is picking it gradually and getting to the right decision. Yeah. And you're just helping them make that decision faster and more accurately. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, so uh, other questions, I, I've got lots more questions. Um, I, I'm curious. So you say you're going to, uh, start a master's program. Tell me about the master's program. And, and also, uh, I'm also curious as, as to, um, well, we'll just start with this. Tell me about the master's program. The master's program. Well, the one that I've applied to and hopefully get into crossing my fingers. Um, it's a data science ones, as I said, and there's like, you know, your classic Bayesian statistics type of courses. Um, your ML type of courses. Mm -hmm. There's also like a cloud component to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember everything on the top of my head, but it's a very like, you get like the big picture of a lot of different, you know, from the stat side, from the AI, ML side, from the cloud side, from the industry side, how to apply data science very cool. um, is how I'd like to summarize it. Um, and why I'm doing it, uh, Initially, my plan would be, oh, work full time only and figure out what you want to do. But I realized I didn't really want to do classic software engineering. I wanted to go into applied sciences. Um, and the, the requirement was get a master's at most places. So I was like, why wait if I know what I want to do? Yeah. Um, I might as well, you know, do the job that I want and not wait if I already know. But 
And uh, so the, uh, are you going to be, do- you said it's all online. Are you going to be doing this full time, this master's program? Or are you going to be working as well? Or how's this going to work out? Sure. Yeah. It's self-paced. Okay. Um, so you can take one course or you can take three. It's up to yeah. you. Um, and you can finish it uh, whenever, as long as you meet the deadlines. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm going to be working full time. That is the plan. Um, Fantastic. Um, and yeah. approximately how long do you think it'll take to complete the, the master's degree? Um, so usually it's, it takes around two years. However, there's a way to transfer courses in from undergrad if you took them. Uh, so I'm transferring in two courses and I plan on taking, it's an eight course program. So I should plan on being done in about a year. So fantastic. Congratulations. That's exciting. Thank you. Um, so I guess the question I have now, now that we know what we know where you've been, we know what you're what you're doing and we know where you're headed. Uh, do you have any words of advice or things that you learned along the way that you think uh, would be worth sharing with other people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I guess an overall advice that I'd like to give college students in general is don't be like, be willing to experiment and try new things. Um, I think the best part about my education that it, that it wasn't just hardcore CS, it wasn't just IS. I took like I had a mind, I forgot to mention, I have a minor in CS, so I got that whole you know nice package. I tried courses that you know I might never apply ever again, like computer architecture, but okay. it exposed me to things like lower level programming and how does programming even work, mm-hmm. um, and how do operating systems work, and that kind of context mm-hmm. can really help you do better in the tech world. Um, and also the importance of, you know, having personal projects or being part of, like, for example, I'm part of the Disruption Lab. Um, Tell me about so, that. Yeah, it's, it's a tech consulting academic unit. Okay. Uh, well, they, yeah, they like to call it an academic unit within the Geese College of Business. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're essentially, you're put into groups as software engineers and you work for a client, usually like a startup or a small company. Um, that's the usual thing. And that really helped me, you know, get, you know, hands-on experience with like actual projects, applying things in the real world versus applying things in the class are Mm. very, very different. Yes. Yes. That's very true. For sure. Yeah. So that, and actually how I even got into generative AI, how I got my project at John Deere was because of disruption lab. Um, I was initially going to do like a very classic analytics type of internship for my second one, Mm -hmm. but, I'd created a, um, or with my team, I'd created a live crypto search engine um, that essentially, yeah, it was really cool. Like you can like look up stuff. So ChatGPT, you know, it has stuff 2021 and before. Um, So you can't really get live summarized data. That's right. Um, So what we want to do is control the information source Uh um, to answer the questions that we're looking up um, in a search bar. And this is, this concept is called retrieval augmented generation. Okay. Um, and we use this technology called LangChain to do it. Um, and we put APIs on the back end, things like, I don't know if you've heard of CoinGecko or DeFi Llama, and they fetch that information for you. Okay. Um, so they have all these like API calls. It mm-hmm. tries to figure out which API call to pick to answer your question. It takes the JSON output and summarizes it into something that a human can understand. Well, wow. That's fascinating. Um, so there is one word that, that really threw me. You said this was, um, so it was uh, you said crypto. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. Where does um, that come so it was from? a crypto search bot. It's like, basically you can ask any questions that you want about crypto, whether it's like, Oh, what are the top coins in India or the U S tell me it's market trends, stuff like that. that. I mean, that sounds fantastic. I I love it. So you've got, you've got this large language model or like a chat GPT type thing that rather than being limited to information prior to 2021, what you've trained it to do is select one of these APIs from which it can get, it can get live information about Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency someone is interested in. And, and you've trained it to select those APIs and then get the information. And then when it gets the information, it summarizes it, which I, I, this sounds amazing. I mean, yeah. that's one of the coolest things I've heard. Thank you. Yeah. And the thing was at that time, we didn't have things like Bing AI. 
that mm -hmm. could give live information. So back then it was even cooler. Um, but yeah, it was, but the, the, for me, the interesting part was learning how to use Langchain and Langchain became the foundation for my next internship. So, um, and that whole concept of being able to send text to chat GP, basically chat GPT um, in an automated manner. Yeah. So. So another thing I love about what you're saying, and this is actually kind of echoes uh, what we, what I've, what we've heard in other podcast episodes, which is you learn and then you apply. So you learned a new technique, this lang chain technique uh, as part of this sort of organization on campus. And then you took that directly to your John Deere internship and you applied it. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually surprised, you know, it's crazy. I didn't, I never picked the path of generative AI or natural language processing. One project sort of built on the other. My first project at John Deere, I did natural language processing um, and D-Lab liked that. So they put me on a generative AI project and then John Deere liked it again. And I they put it. me on a uh, yeah. <laughs> um, generative AI based project. Yeah. So <laughs> success builds on success. I love it. <laughs> I guess so. Um, Absolutely I'm fortunate it. Uh, that it paved out so nicely, but I would like to say on that note that if you don't know your path, mm -hmm. it's completely okay. It's okay to go to work for a bit, figure out what you want to do. Only reason I'm doing my master's once again is because I had that clarity and I know I'm not going to be able to get the job that I want mm -hmm. if I don't do this master's. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, that totally makes sense. I love it. Well, Kushi, I want to thank you very much for, uh, taking the time to be with us today and giving us some advice and sort of just telling us about your journey and your quest in data science. I absolutely love it. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Josh. I, once again, I'm a major, major StatQuest fan. So this is like surreal doing a podcast with you right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this conversation and would love right. to keep connected with you. <laughs> Hooray. Will do. We'll definitely keep in touch.